Which of Evangelion's endings is the real one? Some background. Neon Genesis Evangelion was a landmark giant robot anime whose influence is still felt today. It took a common trope in Japanese children's entertainment, a young boy becomes a man by fighting monsters in a giant robot his father built, and turns it into a Freudian nightmare. It's still a coming-of-age story, but coming-of-age in Evangelion is a terrifying, messy, violent thing. The robots, biological machines full of teeth and blood and the ground-up souls of the pilot's mothers, serve as a potent metaphor for the body horror of adolescence. And the heightened stakes that come from choosing to pilot these fleshbots, doing something scary and risky that puts you in the path of great harm and lets you inflict great harm yourself, stands in for the sudden psychological weight of adulthood. The central question is not whether its protagonist Shinji will be a hero, it's whether he will simply be. Whether he will accept the world with its people and its pain, or retreat into himself, completely safe and utterly alone. In addition to this existential question, there were also cool mech fights and political intrigue, but those take money to animate, and by the time the studio, Gainax, was producing the final episodes, they had none. So instead of wrapping up the plot, the original series finale zeroed in on Shinji's character and his decision whether to accept the hurt of other people or escape into his own mind. It presents these questions in abstract, bloodless terms. The safe void of solipsism, a blank sheet of paper. The pain of knowing and being known, a series of angry scribbles. And it ends with Shinji accepting, wholeheartedly, that he wants to live to try to relate to others even when it hurts, to seek love despite its promise of loss. The rest of the characters applaud and congratulate him. It is, after the agony of the last 24 episodes, a happy ending. Of course, fans hated this. Dropping the plot entirely to lecture on the themes is, to put it mildly, a bold move, and the death threats the studio received were a sort of grim prelude to the worst parts of fandom to come. But because the show was a hit, Gainax had the opportunity to make a movie, titled The End of Evangelion, to provide a more satisfying conclusion. And while my reading of it has always been that the end of Evangelion and the original series finale tell ultimately the same story, their tones are way different. The movie was bleaker and grosser and meaner than even the most horrific parts of the TV show. It, too, ends with the ultimate existential question of to be or not to be, but it's not represented as an abstraction anymore. Though still metaphorical, part of Shinji's head trip, it is rooted in the story and its characters. The pain of being known is not a series of angry scribbles. It's Shinji's fellow pilot Asuka tearing into him for his selfishness and cowardice. And the rejection of others is not a clean, blank sheet of solitude. It's Shinji choking Asuka out. <laughs> the end of Evangelion follows the same rough character arc for Shinji as the series does. He has to decide whether he wants to brave this world. He has his moment of doubt, briefly ending that world to escape it. And finally, he changes his mind, choosing to accept the agony and ecstasy of other people. But that final decision, so triumphant in the original series, is much grimmer in the movie. Instead of rising to his feet while the rest of the cast congratulates him, here Shinji wakes to a desolate beach in a sea of blood, the giant corpse of his friend slash mom slash apotheosis of humanity staring lifelessly ahead. The scene is quiet and deliberate and surreal and excruciating. The only other person is Asuka, this time the real Asuka, not a figment of Shinji's mind, not a synecdoche for other people as a whole, but her own person and all the thrill and terror that promises. And faced with a real person, Shinji relapses. He chokes Asuka again, tries to bring back his solitude through violence but she gently caresses his cheek, and he weeps and loosens his grip, and she tells him, simply, how disgusting. This is the world that Shinji has decided to accept. Not the blue skies and congratulations of the original series, but a strange and silent and barren place, filled with brief, undeserved tenderness and scorn earned many times over. 
He has made the right choice, the good choice, the brave choice, but the reward for that choice is not a bright and happy ceremony, not a sudden, unbreakable will to live, not a cure for his loneliness and pain that means, from here on out, things are going to get better. It is, instead, an awful and iterative process, one where he will stumble and regress, where the challenges of life feel only slightly less terrible than the oblivion that is their alternative. Most of the time, the choice to continue living is automatic, pushed on by momentum and survival instincts. But without going into too much detail, there have been times in my life where it has had to be a very deliberate decision. And sometimes that decision has felt like Evangelion's original ending, and I'm excited to do the scary and difficult things that will make my life better. And sometimes it has felt like the movie's ending, like I am not rising to the challenge but lurching towards it, not filled with a renewed purpose but merely a spite just animating enough to keep me going. The choice to live can be a resounding affirmation of the joys of this world, and it can just as easily be a half-hearted refusal to die just yet. And this is why Evangelion's two endings enrich each other, why they are more effective in tandem than they would be alone. By telling the same story in very different ways, it draws attention to their contrasts while letting those contrasts occupy the same space. It's like one image superimposed on the other, or a word struck through, the end of Evangelion replacing the original finale but not entirely erasing it, showing you clearly both what this new ending is and what it is no longer. This is why my most enduring takeaway of this story's conclusion is not anything in either ending, despite how striking they are in their own ways, but the space between them, the push and the pull, the conversation between their many similarities and crucial differences. On their own, each ending is just one thing, no matter how effective that thing is. Together, though, there's something else. This is novel because most stories, with their single endings, encourage the reader to extrapolate from the final scene. A moment of happiness becomes happily ever after, while a downer ending suggests a whole world of sadness when the story finally ends. The Sopranos uses this to interesting effect by making the paranoia of its last scene stretch out like an eternal punishment. An ending does not show us every single thing that happens to this universe and its inhabitants, but by showing us one last thing, it asks us to fill in the rest accordingly. But the strange harmony of Evangelion's two endings doesn't allow for such a neat extrapolation. That they are at odds with each other, two tellings of the same thing, means that one single tone doesn't get to define what this world becomes. That, instead, there is dissonance. There is, where the conflict of the story is supposed to give way to resolution, more conflict. Whereas a bittersweet ending may contain several feelings within its whole, these endings defy wholeness entirely. And, given what the ending is about, that's perfect. Because Evangelion is ultimately about Shinji's decision to live, to hurt, to be. And, no matter the telling, his decision is yes. But that yes is never final. You do not choose just once to go on, then go on forever. It is a choice you have to make over and over, and you will make it in the optimism of the series finale and the weary loathing of the film, in grace and in shame, triumphantly and worn to marrow, beneath blue skies and amidst slick nightmare blackness, at once a chorus of congratulations and a single whisper of how disgusting. Either ending, on their own, captures a moment of this decision, but together they hold its exhausting repetition, its ebb and flow, its unending burden of a commitment kept. The answer to the question we opened with, which of these endings is the real one, is not, as I had suspected it would be when I started writing this, both of them. Instead, it is neither. For in the space between them, the arc of lightning between two poles, there is no ending at all. There is none of an ending's peace, none of its certainty, none of its relief. There is only the story's middle, stretching on and on, wonderfully and awfully, forward.